speak here today to you all. Um, I've been to Burston a few times myself and I've often sat here and listened to the speakers. I never thought that I would be one of them. So it's a real privilege. And I'd like to thank a few of the organisers. Um, I'd like to thank Unite the Union, Surtark, South East Regional TUC, and of course the Burston Strike School trustees for putting their faith in me today to have a chat with you and hopefully not to let them down. In many ways, I think coming here today is like a secular pilgrimage. It's where we come to pay our respects, if you like, to an achievement of a small community of people who stood up against insurmountable odds. And they won. And I think as a movement in this day and age, with the Tory coalition in power, cutting and slashing and burning, it's something we need to take heart from, from what they achieved. And that's why I think many of us come here today. But I often ask myself, if we took someone from the Burston era and brought them in a time capsule to, that, to today, what would they think of the progress that we've made? Now in 1918, four years after the start of Burston, at the end of the First World War, millions of people dead on the battlefields, working people dead on the battlefields of France and Belgium. They were promised that when they came back, it would be a land fit for heroes. And they got back. And what did they find? The same old class system. And they found that 50% of the wealth in that society was in the hands of just 10% of the population. Well, fast forward to today, 95 years later, modern 21st century Britain, and you find that 55% of the wealth of this country is in the hands of just 10% of the people. The more things change, the more things stay the same. Now, it hasn't always been that way. There was a time when wealth inequality actually began to fall. And you probably guess when. It was with the advent of the welfare state. But for the past 30 years, that welfare state has been attacked and dismantled. And consequently, wealth inequality has increased. And I'm ashamed to say that my party, the party that I am a candidate for, it happened in part on its watch. And that was wrong. I completely, completely concede that. And I think, I think many of you here too will today. Now don't get me wrong, I'm also proud to be a Labour candidate because we had some fantastic achievements. We lifted 900,000 children out of poverty and stopped another 900,000 from falling into it. One of the greatest feats of anti-poverty action in modern history. That's something I'm proud of. We introduced Sure Start, the minimum wage, child tax credits, educational maintenance allowance, the health in pregnancy grant, these are all things everyone in this movement should be proud of, because I know I am. But we need to see more of it. But the sad truth is, it wasn't enough. We didn't tackle the crisis in affordable housing, arguably one of the biggest challenges to face this country. We didn't begin to rebalance the economy. We had no industrial policy. We're still over-reliant on the city of London. And we didn't tackle the culture of greed in business and banking. Instead, we opted for light touch regulating, regulation and we embraced the worst aspects of free market fundamentalism to my shame and now we are all paying for it, quite literally. <coughs> so what else would the strikers of Burston have recognised about our society today? Well, when you read the history of Burston, uh, you, you see constant references to poverty wages and the fight for a living wage uh, or the risk of hunger. Well, 95 years later, and we're still fighting for the same things. Food banks and soup kitchens are increasing in number. And average pay here in Norfolk is some of the lowest in the country. And yet we know that just paying <coughs> a pound extra an hour on the minimum wage can be the difference between living in poverty and living with dignity. But ultimately, it's also a matter of basic social and economic justice. Chief executives in this country last year earned, on average, 
million pounds each. Now, I work for the BBC, but I'm not even going back in my lifetime, okay? And I know most of you won't. The average British worker earned 162 times less than that. That is an outrage. How can that ever be justified in a modern, civilised society? Quite simply, it can't. And whilst a living wage and the campaign for a living wage is a start, I believe we also need to campaign and legislate for pay ratios, limiting the gap between the highest and the lowest pay within our society, ending the obscenity of excessive pay and bonuses. So what else, so what else should a future Labour government legislate for? I'm all ears, please tell me. What else should it legislate for? Give me some suggestions. I, there's a good one there, a good one there. What about scrapping Gove's free schools and academies? Let's put education back in the hands of democratically controlled local authorities. Let's show as a party the same passion the Tories show for elitist, divisive education. We can show the same passion for comprehensive, universal education. What about giving free school meals? to every single primary school child yes. in this country. The scandal in 21st century Britain of school children going to school so hungry they can't learn has to end. Yes. How about investing? Oh, some more. Yes, I'll start with the end, with, the, with the New York, with Wall Street. Alright, I'll let you have your turn in a minute. I'll let you have your turn in a minute. I'm on a watch. I'm on a clock. Alright, alright, I'll carry on. Alright, I'll give you another one. I'll give you another one. I'll give you one. You might like it. How about, let me give you one. How about building millions of new, sustainably built council homes? Yeah. From 1938, from 1918 to 1939, when this country was bankrupt after the First World War, we built four million new homes. Four million. We couldn't even touch that now. With the political will, we could end the housing crisis, create tens of thousands of jobs, and kickstart the economy in a sustainable way. It's a no-brainer. Scrap anti-trade union laws. That's, I'm coming on to that one. Give me a chance. Give me a chance. But let me tell you something else. In the last four years, this country, this government, has spent a hundred billion pounds on housing, 95 billion on housing benefit, and five billion on building new homes. Now don't listen to the Daily Mail and the Express. The scandal isn't the people claiming benefits. The scandal are the slum landlords who each year are claiming three and a half billion pounds to put up families in homes that you would not put your dog in. That is the true scandal. So another piece of legislation. Don't cap housing benefit, cap rents. That's the solution, not capping housing benefit. Okay, so you, you, you prompted me. What about repealing Thatcher's anti-trade union legislation? I'm ashamed that the last government didn't repeal that. They should have. We have more draconian laws here in terms of trade union legislation than anywhere else in the country. In fact, the strikers of Burston under the 1906 Trade Union Act had more rights than we do today to take industrial action. The thousands, tens of thousands of workers in this country who are victimised and dismissed for doing nothing more than following through on a basic human right to take industrial action is a scandal and the next Labour government should repeal that legislation. You've got my support on that. Legal aid. Come into that, come into that. There's lots of other speakers as well. So, when the bankers and the financial speculators and the media barons turn around and say, well, who's going to pay for this? Well, it's easy. You are. You're going to pay for it. And I'll tell you how. By closing down the tax loopholes that the likes of Vodafone and Barclays and other multinational companies and the super rich like Philip Green siphon hundreds of millions of pounds out of this country. That'll raise 120 billion pounds. What about implementing a financial transaction tax at 0.1% like they have in France and the rest of Europe recently? That will raise another £40 billion. There's your deficit wiped out. And let's take a leaf out of Nick Clegg's book. He had one good idea. Let's introduce a wealth tax. Let's begin to reduce that wealth inequality in this country permanently. 
that's a start. But also, let's have a progressive taxation system, not the insanely regressive one we have at the moment. In France, they just introduced a 75% rate of tax. I didn't see their rich and wealthy flocking to London on the red carpet that Cameron put out for them, because they understand if you want to have a civilised society with proper public transport, hospitals and roads that all of your citizens can, act, can access, not just the rich and wealthy, then you have to have a progressive taxation system. So let's make sure we reinstate the 50p rate of tax as a bare minimum. Now, there is another issue, and Julie did touch on it, and I want to come on to this because it is linked to what's happening at the moment in our society. Whilst the burst and strike was ongoing, through the 19s and 20s and 30s, there was a depression. And there was also something else, the rise of fascism. Now, fascism came about, simply put, because mainstream politicians were unwilling or unable to tackle the problems within their societies and their economies. That's why fascism took a foothold. My grandfather's generation spent the best years of their life and their lives correcting that mistake from 1936 to 1945. And that's why I am filled with disgust when just 60 years later we have two fascist MEPs, <coughs> Nick Griffin and Andrew Bronze, representing this country in the Europe my grandfather's generation spent their lives liberating. It is disgusting. It is disgusting. It is disgusting. And let me tell you something else. That is why perhaps on October the 20th, when the, uh, when the TUC demonstration in London is on, I might not be down in London because I may be standing shoulder to shoulder with that organisation that was mentioned. We are Norwich. As you, as you know, last weekend in Walthamstow, we are Walthamstow, the community stood up to the fascist English Defence League. If the fascist English Defence League want to come to Norwich, they need to know that they will not be able to march unopposed through our city, spreading their vile hatred and creed of hate. So I would say to you, any of you here today, if you are not going down to the TUC demonstration, come to Norwich, support We Are Norwich, support the Muslims, the Christians, the trade unions, the people who will be standing up for their right to live in peace without the fascists breathing down their neck. Now, I'm going to finish now, because I have been waffling for a bit. And I'm going to finish with a little bit of an appeal. Because I wanted to uh, explain that I sometimes feel on the left there is a tendency to see the political economy in terms of just jobs and growth and shares of national income. But I believe we need to take on fact that our planet is in grave peril. The endless cycle of consumption without regard to the planet's ability to sustain it cannot continue. Told you Even if we act to erase material poverty, there is another greater risk, and that's to confront the poverty of satisfaction, purpose and dignity that affects us all. For too long, we seem to have surrendered personal excellence and community values to the mere accumulation of material things. And I wanted to read a very small extract from a speech from someone called Robert F. Kennedy. He's an American politician. I know they don't go down too well at events like this, but I read this a little bit. It was written in 1968, almost 40 years ago, and it is, in fact, quite prophetic and visionary. He was killed three months after writing it. Our gross national product now is over $800 billion a year. But that gross national product, if we judge the United States of America by that gross national product, counts air pollution and cigarette advertising and ambulances to clear our highways of carnage. It counts special locks for our doors and the jails for the people who break them. It counts the destruction of the redwoods and the loss of our natural wonder in chaotic sprawl. It counts napalm and counts nuclear warheads and armoured cars for the police to fight the riots in our cities. It counts Whitman's rifle and Speck's knife and the television programmes which glorify violence in order to sell toys to our children. Yet the gross national product does not allow for the health of our children, the quality of their education or the joy of their play. It does not include the beauty of our poetry or the strength of our marriages, the intelligence of our public debate or the integrity 
of our public officials. It measures neither our wit nor our courage, neither our wisdom nor our learning, neither our compassion nor our devotion to our country. It measures everything in short except that which makes life worthwhile. The Burston strikers knew they were right, knew their cause was just, just as we know we are right to continue the fight for a better, more equal, fairer society. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Have a good march.